When you have 21 minutes to speak, two million years seems like a really long time. But evolutionarily, two million years is nothing. And yet in two million years, the human brain has nearly tripled in mass, going from the one and a quarter pound brain of our ancestor here, Habilis, to the almost three pound meatloaf that everybody here has between their ears. What is it about a big brain that nature was so eager for every one of us to have one? Well, it turns out when brains triple in size, they don't just get three times bigger, they gain new structures. And one of the main reasons that our brain got so big is because it got a new part called the frontal lobe, and particularly a part called the prefrontal cortex. Turns out the prefrontal cortex does lots of things, but one of the most important things it does is it is an experience simulator. You know, flight, uh, pilots practice in flight simulators so that they don't make real mistakes in planes. Human beings have this marvelous adaptation that they can actually have experiences in their heads before they try them out in real life. This is a trick that none of our ancestors could do, that no other animal can do quite like we can. <laughs> Let's see how your experience simulators are working. Here's two different futures that I invite you to contemplate, and you can try to simulate them and tell me which one you think you might prefer. One of them is uh, winning the lottery. This is about $314 million. And the other is becoming paraplegic. So just give it a moment of thought. You probably don't feel like you need a moment of thought. And interestingly, there are data on these two groups of people, data on how happy they are. These are the data, sure. Because the fact is that a year after losing the use of their legs and a year after winning the lotto, lottery winners and paraplegics are equally happy with their lot. The research that my laboratory has been doing, that economists and psychologists around the country have been doing, have revealed something really quite startling to us. Something we call the impact bias, which is the tendency for the simulator to work badly. For the simulator to make you believe that different outcomes are more different than in fact they really are. From field studies to laboratory studies, we see that winning or losing an election, gaining or losing a romantic partner, getting or not getting a promotion, passing or not passing a college test, on and on, have far less impact, less intensity, and much less duration than people expect them to have. Why? Because happiness can be synthesized. Human beings have something that we might think of as a psychological immune system, a system of cognitive processes, largely non-conscious cognitive processes, that help them change their views of the world so that they can feel better about the worlds in which they find themselves. Maurice Bickham is somebody you've never heard of. Maurice Bickham uttered these words. Upon being released, he was 78 years old, he'd spent 37 years in Louisiana State Penitentiary for a crime he didn't commit. He was ultimately exonerated at the age of 78 through DNA evidence, and what did he have to say about his experience? I don't have one minute's regret, it was a glorious experience. Glorious! This guy is not saying, well, you know, there's some nice guys, they had a gym. It's glorious, a word we usually reserve for something like a religious experience. Oh, and then finally, you know, the best of all possible worlds. Some of you recognize this young photo of Pete Best, who was the original drummer for the Beatles, until they, you know, kind of like sent him out on an errand and snuck away and picked up Ringo on a tour. Well, in 1994, when Pete Best was interviewed, yes, he's still a drummer, yes, he's a studio musician, he had this to say, I'm happier than I would have been with the Beatles. We smirk because we believe that synthetic happiness is not of the same quality as what we might call natural happiness. What are these terms? Natural happiness is what we get when we get what we wanted, and synthetic happiness is what we make when we don't get what we wanted. <laughs> I want to suggest to you that synthetic happiness is every bit as real and enduring as the kind of happiness you stumble upon when you get exactly what you were aiming for. These are Monet prints. So everybody can rank these Monet prints from the one they like the most to the one they like the least. Now we give you a choice. We happen to have some extra prints in the closet, and we're going to give you one as your prize to take home. We happen to have number three and number four, we tell the subject. Naturally, people tend to pick number three because they liked it a little better than number four. Sometime later, it could be 15 minutes, it could be 15 days, the same stimuli are put before the subject and the subject is asked to re-rank the stimuli. Tell us how much you like them now. 
What happens? Watch as happiness is synthesized. This is the result that has been replicated over and over again. You're watching happiness be synthesized. Would you like to see it again? <laughs> happiness! The one I got is really better than I thought. That other one I didn't get sucks. Had interrograde amnesia. These are hospitalized patients. Most of them have... It turns out that freedom, the ability to make up your mind and change your mind, is the friend of natural happiness because it allows you to choose among all those delicious futures that, and find the one that you would most enjoy. But freedom to choose, to change and make up your mind is the enemy of synthetic happiness. And I'm going to show you why. The psychological immune system works best when we are totally stuck, when we are trapped. This is, this is the difference between dating and marriage, right? I mean, you go out on a date with a guy and he picks his nose. You don't go out on another date. You're married to a guy and he picks his nose. Yeah, he has a heart of gold, right? You find a way to be happy with what's happened. Now, what I want to show you is that people don't know this about themselves, and not knowing this can work to our supreme disadvantage. Here's an experiment we did at Harvard. We created a photography course, a black and white photography course, and we allowed students to come in and learn how to use a darkroom. So we gave them cameras, they went around campus, they took 12 pictures of their favorite professors in their dorm room and their, you know, their dog and all the other things they wanted to have hundred memories of. They bring us the camera, we make up a contact sheet, they figure out which are the two best pictures, and we now spend six hours teaching them about dark rooms, and they blow two of them up and they have two gorgeous 8 by 10 glossies of meaningful things to them, and we say, which one would you like to give up? They say, I have to give one up? Oh yes, we need one as evidence of the class project. So you have to give me one, you have to make a choice, you get to keep one, and I get to keep one. Now, there are two conditions in this experiment. In one case, the students are told, but you know, if you want to change your mind, I'll always have the other one here, and in the next four days before I actually mail it to headquarters, I'll be glad to, yeah, headquarters, I'll be glad to swap it out with you. In fact, I'll come to your dorm room and give, just give me an email, better yet, I'll check with you. You ever want to change your mind? It's totally returnable. The other half of the students are told exactly the opposite. Make your choice, and by the way, the mail is going out, gosh, in two minutes to England, your picture will be winging its way over the Atlantic, you will never see it again. Now, half of the students in each of these conditions are asked to make predictions about how much they're going to come to like the picture that they keep and the picture they leave behind. Other students are just sent back to their little dorm rooms, and they are measured over the next uh, six to, uh, three to six days on their liking and satisfaction with the pictures. Look at what we find. First of all, here's what students think is going to happen. They think they're going to maybe come to like the picture they chose a little more than the one they left behind. wrong -o. Bad simulators. Because here's what's really happening, both right before the swap and five days later. People who are stuck with that picture, who have no choice, who can never change their mind, like it a lot. And people who are deliberating, should I return it? Have I gotten the right one? Maybe this isn't the good one. Maybe I left the good one. Have killed themselves. They don't like their picture. And in fact, even after the opportunity to swap has expired, they still don't like their picture. So here's the final piece of this experiment. We bring in a whole new group of naive Harvard students and we say, you know, we're doing a photography course and we can do it one of two ways. We could do it so that when you take the two pictures, you'd have four days to change your mind. Or we're doing another course where you take the two pictures and you make up your mind right away and you can never change it. Which course would you like to be in? Duh! 66% of the students, two-thirds, prefer to be in the course where they have the opportunity to change their mind. Hello, 66% of the students choose to be in the course in which they will ultimately be deeply dissatisfied with the picture. <laughs> because they do not know the conditions under which synthetic happiness grows. The lesson I want to leave you with from these data is that our longings and our worries are both to some degree overblown because we have within us the capacity to manufacture the very commodity we are constantly chasing when we choose experience. Thank you.